The Goldenrod Foundation is pleased to present the first talk in its series, Making Waves in Coastal Conservation. The series features up-and-coming experts working with new technologies, innovative ideas, and fresh perspectives in southeastern Massachusetts. Our first speaker is Lindsay Hurt, a conservation advocate specializing in risk management for whales and dolphins. She is presently earning an MS degree in emergency management concentrating on situations that affect wildlife. Lindsay's talk is entitled, Getting It Right for the Right Whale, How New Technologies Are Saving Whales. Thank you so much for, for coming here and supporting me tonight. I've been working in the field of conservation a really long time, and I can say that a lot more of it has been volunteer than paid hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's just kind of what you do. You know, you, uh, you stomp in and do what you can to the best of your ability for a cause you care about. And that's why I'm here, because I think the answer to absolutely everything including all conservation measures, is public education. So I'm really glad you guys are out here to, uh, to hear about it. So thank you for that. I appreciate the forum. Uh, right now, I'm talking about <coughs> whales. Uh, anybody ever seen one of these before? Not just the plastic toy from China, but the actual whale before? OK, so a couple of you have braved the New England waters to see these babies, hopefully New England. Um, they shouldn't really be anywhere else, since there's only 492 left in the world. Um, so tonight's talk is called Getting It Right for the Right Whale, How New Technologies Are Saving Whales. Um, Dory mentioned a little while ago that I'm a master's student at Mass Maritime Academy. I'm just about to wrap up the program now, and my interest in whales stemmed to my thesis, my capstone thesis, which is about mitigating vessel strikes on right whales. So if you came tonight to hear about all the different kind of whales, you're going to have to wait until May for my next yeah. talk at Beach Ambassador, because I'm going to kind of cone it right in on the issue of vessel strikes and how they have affected right whales in particular. Um, right whales are they're a really cool animal. There's not an awful lot of them. I really love them. They're tubby and adorable and just <laughs> so cute. And I just can't stand to see them gone, so I hope you guys will join me in the effort. Um, so thanks. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> it's better than fair whale, isn't it? <laughs> So what I'm going to talk about today, I just wanted to give you a timeline of what I'm doing. I promise you're only with me for about an hour, longer if you want to talk more. You're welcome to do that. Um, but I just want to give you a sort of a, an outline of what I'm going to discuss. First, for those of you that have no idea why you're sitting in these chairs, um, what is a right whale and why do we even care about them? Um, the next thing that we're going to talk about is what threatens their existence, why they are endangered. And also, who's responsible for making sure that they don't die out and go extinct? What measures we're doing to protect them? Some of them are federal, some of them are state, some of them are in your backyard, some of them are individual. Um, how can technology save the right whale? Which is really what we're doing here tonight, is, is talking about um, what modern technology we can apply to these conservation measures. And most importantly for all of you here, when and where can we actually see a right whale? Because I know you guys want to get your butts out on the beach and go take a look, right? Yeah? You want to do some beach watching instead of getting on a boat? So also, I brought a couple of specimens to touch. Um, one of them is in a, sealed in a box right now because if I left it out, you'd all be smelling whale oil and it's pretty gross. So I'll wait till the end to bring that one out. <laughs> Meet the North Atlantic right whale, Eubilena glacialis. Does anyone know what that means? true cold whale of the north? Okay. Um, so what they are, everyone in this room probably knows what a, what a mammal is, right? They have hair, they give birth to live young, they give milk to their babies, right? Get that? They breathe. Um, they're warm-blooded, they breathe from lungs, those kinds of things. You know what a mammal is, I probably don't need to go over that. Um, but they're a large baleen whale, and I'm just going to pop over here for one moment. Excuse me. And I am going to take this out later, and you are free to touch, just as long as you don't wing it around like a boomerang. Um, <coughs> this is but one plate, but one piece yeah. of baleen from actually a bowhead whale, which is really closely related to a right whale. Um, they're almost in the same genus, not quite, but almost. And so I brought this tonight to show you that these are specialized feeders. They, they filter feed very, very little copepods. Um, which we're going to see a little picture of later. But I just wanted to make sure that everyone knew this was here because you really shouldn't leave the room without checking it out. Um, you have to have a special permit to have it, and it's been graciously borrowed from whale and dolphin conservation for tonight. Um, so adults, these are pretty large animals, 45 to 55 feet, and some have actually been recorded at 60. If you're in a boat and you're next to that, you're looking at a pretty big a gargantuan beast there. Um, the babies are really just little itty-bitty babies, you know, just the size of like a cat. 
caravan and a half, <laughs> uh, 15 to 20 feet. And their lifespan, well, that actually is a total lie. We don't really know exactly how old right whales can get. Um, part of the problem is because there's so many other effects on them that cause them to lose their lives a little early, on the early side. It's hard to tell, but we're estimating between 50 and 70 years, so I kind of split the difference and went with 60. Um, they are considered the urban whale, if any of you have ever read the book by Scott Krauss. He's a very, very, very famous right whale scientist uh, who works out of the New England Aquarium. He wrote a book about them some years back, about the size of War and Peace, twice as good, I promise you, um, called the urban whale. And it talks all about the plight of the right whale. And why are they called the urban right whale? Well, because of their habitat. They are very close, very close to shore, so close that it creates a lot of problems. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Why are right whales endangered? Surely we know the answer to this, if any of us have been in New England for more than a year, right? <laughs> this was the whaling territory of the world. Um, well, not quite, actually. Europe, Western Europe, there was a lot of whaling long ago. Um, with the right whales, they were the preferred hunting target before any other whale because they're so tubby and fat, and they have great reserves of oil in their, in their blubber, which is really low in density, and so therefore it, it floats pretty easily. And who doesn't love a whale that they can get lots and lots of oil from, and also meat when you're going to eat it, that floats on top of the water so that you can actually take the blubber right off before you even bring it into your boat, right? So it was pretty easy. Um, that started out in about the 11th century with the Basques in Canada um, and, and spread to Europe. And of course, we all know about New Bedford and the Nantucket situation and all the whales that were taken there. So it got to the point where we hit about 1750, and these whales were so depleted that at some point they just said, we've got to switch to another type of whale. We can't even go for the right whale anymore because there aren't that many left. And so at that point, the, the stocks became so depleted that in 1935, they actually stopped hunting whales entirely. It became against the law. And at that point, there were maybe, maybe 100 left. So that's pretty low. Imagine if there were only 100 humans left in the world. I actually wouldn't mind, because there wouldn't be any more pollution. But 100 right whales, that's pretty sad. So um, at, right now, they have come back up a little bit, but they're so, so slow to recover. So let's look at why that is. So we did the history part. Next up is the biology and life history. The life of a right whale. What's it like? Well, they're filter feeders. You remember a few moments ago, how could you forget, that hugely long plate of baleen that filters these teeny tiny little copepods here. This is one millimeter, if you can't see it, one millimeter in a microscope. Okay? The Calanus finmarchicus is the particular type of copepod that they seem to like the best. And guess where they hang out? Well, right at the surface of the water, or very close to. So, these animals, and I picked this particular photo, um, I know it's a little bit faded out so you can see the writing, but here's an animal here, and here's an animal here. This is a mother, and, well, we're not sure if it's a daughter or a son yet, but these guys showed up to Cape Cod Bay in December of 2012, and my good friend Monica was able to get a photograph uh, of these guys together. You see how low their profile is in the water. Well, they're, they're actually feeding. The baby was nursing, and the mom was feeding, because it happened to be a great, great time, really early in the season, actually, um, for them to be feeding. But there they were, back in Cape Cod, up from the south, and it was really hard to see them until everyone knew that they were there, and then everybody went to go and visit them. Um, but so the deal is, they're really, really slow swimmers. They have huge mouths that have a giant arch in them, and when they, when they feed, they feed at the surface, or really close to the surface of the water, and they fill, fill, fill their mouths with so much water just to filter out these little teeny tiny plankton here. They need to do that a lot, and for a really long time. If you were walking around dragging tons and tons of weight on you, especially if it was in your mouth that expanded like a giant balloon, you'd probably swim pretty slowly as well. Am I guessing correctly? Yeah, so they're not really going to go very far. And they're not really going to be able to turn away from something if, if something's out to get them. So, um, so there's a lot of problems with, with the adorable little features they have. They're really docile. They're um, you know, there are these specialized feeders. They also have no dorsal fin. If you've ever been in a whale watch before, maybe in Florida, maybe in Alaska to see orcas, maybe you've seen the dolphins uh, off of the Hyannis Whale Watcher boat or Captain John in Plymouth. Usually you see one of these, right? Coming off the top, a dorsal fin. Well, lucky right whales, they don't have one. So it makes them even lower profile. 
Um, to add to that travesty, um, where it's so difficult for them to be seen in the water and they can easily get hit by boats, it also takes them forever and a year to have a baby. So we think they maybe live to 60 years. Um, they become sexually mature around 10 years, and so that would kind of be similar to humans if you were to look at the ratios. But the only problem with that is they, they don't seem to have a lot of babies in a lifetime because if you're a big fat tubby whale and need to make a big fat tubby baby who's 15 or 20 pounds, is that going to be any light task? Of course not. You're going to have to put a real lot of reserves into that. And so, yes, it takes them 13 months to make a baby, release that baby, and then they have to hold on to it for a year and babysit it to tell it what to do. So it's kind of a commitment. And after that, we've got to gain a lot of weight again. So we're looking at three to five years. The studies that I have been working with show that the average female, healthy female, that reaches maturity and dies at a normal age might produce 5.6, on average, calves in her lifetime. So if one singular mom is removed out of the population, which has been done many a time with a vessel, unfortunately, we then lose the potential to have possibly up to six babies. Threats to species survival. I've alluded to it many a time already in just a few slides here. Right whales experience many of them. You all know of them. I think you go a little low here, it's hard to see that. But right whales suffer a lot of anthropogenic effects on top of the fact that it kind of takes them forever to have a baby. Well, we've heard about marine debris. We've heard about entanglements on Cape Cod. There's actually a specialized team devoted solely to taking off the ropes and the crab traps and lobster pots from animals. Very dangerous work, by the way. Um, if you can see up here, I just put in a teeny little picture of an entanglement situation here. Um, this was taken on a vessel from the specialized team in Provincetown. Maybe you've heard of them, the Center for Coastal Studies. Mm -hmm. They're pretty big around here. Yeah, I pretty much idolize everybody that's there. Anyway, they're on that team and they do disentangle the whales when they have issues, but you know, you can't just go around disentangling every whale in the world, not only because you can't see them, because they're, they might be anywhere, but also because it's a pretty tough job. So that's not the only problem, though. We also have issues with pollution. The average right whale has a mouth that's pretty big, maybe 15 feet long. But how big is their throat? Smaller than this plate. Does that surprise anybody? Mm. Yeah. yeah? You'd think it would be a little bit bigger than that. The brownies look good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, but don't forget, they only eat that little tiny cocoa pod, so they don't really have to swallow a lot at a time, and they really can't because it's not like there's just little spots of cocoa pods anywhere you go, free for the taking. They have to work to, to filter those out. So they have really tiny throats. If you put a plastic bag into the ocean, most of the time it's on accident, right? But it happens. They can choke on them. Very recently, about a year ago, a sperm whale washed up on a beach somewhere, and it had 46 pounds of trash in it. And it was found that the reason why the animal died was because in its own feeding habits, it swallowed so much of this plastic and trash that it actually died from the excess weight in its stomach. It couldn't digest food anymore. So that is an issue. However, today, what do we care about? Vessel strikes. This picture right here is a great iconic image that's been floated all over the world. Um, that's why I can say the photo is from public domain because it's everywhere. Um, this is a blue whale, the largest marine mammal, the largest organism that ever lived on the planet, about 100 feet long, three school buses size, that this majestic beast was killed by a shipping vessel coming into port at the port of Colombo in Sri Lanka. No, it's not just a local problem. And I intentionally put up there a blue whale so that you can see that it does happen to other animals. So we'll take a look and see if there are others. So um, the North Atlantic right whale, NARW, by the way, I'm sorry, I probably should have put up what that meant. You probably know by now. They have a very specific way that they do things. They like to migrate. We all know what migrating is now, right? I don't have to do that lesson. Good. Okay. So in the north, where there's nice, cold, oxygenated water, we tend to see the feeding grounds and also the mating grounds. Lots of fun up here. And it's a little bit more spread out. This does happen year-round because it's kind of cold water all the time. No one really wants to go swimming at the beach. Going all the way up into Roseway Basin, up into Newfoundland, and out here, sort of, kind of, we don't know exactly where they always are, but we look for them and we find them and they're out there. Um, they never spread further than this. They don't go out to Western Europe anymore. They're functionally extinct there. We've seen relatively few in the Gulf of Mexico in the last 50 years. Probably will never see them there again. Why would they go there if the food's not good, right? Um, and then what they do is they migrate south, 
all along, we call this the migratory corridor. Where is it? Right along the coast. And they move all the way to the calving and nursing grounds in that nice warm water where it's really easy to have babies who maybe aren't that fat yet. So this is what they tend to do. Doesn't seem like a big problem. It's pretty easy. We know exactly where they are. We should be able to help them, right? Except there's this one other issue. This, I know it's a little blurry, but I did that intentionally so that you could see how much traffic there truly is, is a map of the middle of the, of the Atlantic, so the mid-Atlantic region, okay, Maryland area, okay, of just one month of vessel traffic. One month, okay? So look at what these animals have to contend with as they hug the coast and come down. It's kind of like playing Frogger, except for your life. And also, you know, we have recreational boats to contend with too, and I haven't even gotten to that. But let me move you to the next one. So I did want to make that point again that marine, many marine mammals, aside from right whales, are affected by vessel strikes. Um, here we have a minke whale. This was the, one of the first necropsies I ever did in my life, was a minke whale hit by a, a vessel. Um, my good friend Heidi Hansen took a photograph of this humpback whale that was hit but not killed. You can see the scarring there. Um, <clears throat> up here in BC, the fin whale, the same thing happened to that one as did the blue whale. Got hung up on the bow of a vessel. And then this is my own picture here. This is a really special story to me, actually a good survival story of a humpback whale right here in Cape Cod. This lady here is Ganesh. She is a fantastic mom, and she kept, kept track of her baby. Um, 2011 is when this baby was born. It was born probably, I don't know, January, February. It was hit in July by a boat. Do you see these arrows? You can see the, the scarring there. It was so wide open, everyone was sure this little baby was going to die. But we kept track of it, and you know what? It healed right up, and it was still with its mom at the end of the year. So good story all around just kind of sad to know that after just six months of life, we're already seeing little babies getting hit by boats. So sometimes, as you saw in a few of the pictures before, they survive. Here are some from New England Aquarium where they you see these really huge propeller strikes. These are from larger vessels. And then others that, of course, do not. You can see how easily a whale might run into a boat or a boat might run into a whale. Nobody ever knows the difference. Just a short little clip here in the in the back region, the, the caudal region here, they call that the peduncle, just behind the tail. There's a lot of big arteries there. It's pretty easy to kill a whale and not even know that you did it. So. Now, the inspiration for some of the conservation efforts that we've been sort of running with the last 10 years is this really beautiful whale, this right whale, named Raina. Um, she was actually pregnant with a calf. About 15 years old she was, and her baby was estimated to be about 10 months old what it was hit off the coast of Virginia in 2004. Um, and so what they did was they used this animal as a teaching tool. It's a real tragic situation because as I said before, I gave you those stats about how the average mom may have 5.6 babies in a lifetime. Well, she was at the beginning of, of her sexual maturity. So that may have been her first calf. I'm actually not even sure about that. Um, but we use that as an example and as a source of inspiration to work towards future conservation efforts. And so her articulated skeleton, and also, if you can see, a little bitty baby calf, exactly as it sat inside her abdomen um, when she was hit, are articulated, and they are in the New Bedford Whaling Museum in New Bedford. If you ever care to go there, it's absolutely worth the visit. Even if you just never go inside the building other than the cathedral ceiling area where these whales are hung up in the sky, it just looks so amazing, and you can see every part. It's really worth it. And I can tell you from personal experience, I helped to put together a minke whale in college. It was only 15 feet long. It took me almost four years from dead animal to articulated skeleton here. And that's what kind of a process you're facing. So imagine if you have, this here is a blue whale, 100 feet long, or in Raina's case, 49 feet long. It's kind of a big deal. So we use Raina as our example to move forward with this issue of vessel strikes and how it affects right whales and also other whales. Um, the first of many conservation measures were put to the test for NOAA to deal with. Um, they're the ones who are responsible for marine protected species. And so we have some federal and state protections. Some of you may have heard of them before. I'm sure everyone in the room has heard Endangered Species Act before, and probably Marine Mammal Protection Act. Well, by federal and state level, the right whale, as well as many other marine mammals, are protected under those acts. And because those are in existence, we do have measures that we continue to take because of them. And so some of the ones that we have looked at that have been in effect for quite a while, 
for over 15 years, I believe, the 500-yard rule has been in effect, and that one is pretty self-explanatory. If you don't have a special permit for collecting a sample, an organism, or doing research, don't go within 500 yards of these animals. Remember how hard I said that that was before? It's very hard. That's why you need to know about it. A mandatory ship reporting system. There's a really, really great vessel to do this. Um, where you can you can call out if you see an animal and it can be reported back to people and there's a system to, to look at that. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later when we come to whale alert. And then finally, and most uh, beloved to me, is the ship strike rule, which went in effect in 2009 and lasted about five years. Very, very recently it was, I guess, reanimated or I'll say extended indefinitely. Um, and so that's in effect, as far as we know, forever right now. But. The thing that that does, it's a very strong piece of ruling, it has it developed many seasonal management areas, or areas where we know that the whales generally are in density every season. So we see them in this area for one part of the year, we see them in this area for one part of the year, and I'll show you some maps on that, where vessels, when they come into those areas on the map, they need to slow down. Now, there's a couple little caveats there. That's only for vessels that are over 65 feet, okay, and also sovereign vessels like you know, Coast Guard, they're excluded if they want to be. It also um, allows for some other restrictions. There's voluntary speed reductions in temporary areas where whales might be. So it just kind of helps us out to slow down because what we know about right whales is that the faster the boat goes, the more likely they are to die from getting hit by a vessel, which I'm sure is the same for a little kid in a school zone, right? That's why we have school zones that are under 20 miles per hour. Another conservation measure which has been highly successful um, when we know where the whales are through all of our survey efforts, we can kind of develop these maps, sort of like a Google map, where we can see the density of where they are, either per season, per day, per year, whatever we need to do. And we can kind of locate where they are and how they're congregating. Now, they're not going to do the exact same thing every year, but over time we get these trends. And what we see is the trend. You see how thick this area is and how dense it is with animals. So what we originally had was a shipping lane that entered into the Boston Harbor here see that. What we did was we shifted it just a little bit, just enough that we didn't have to worry too much about interacting with whales. And that actually worked so well putting that into effect that it was done in another location. Um, um, the third major conservation measure, of course, is public education, which is why I'm here speaking to you tonight. Not only through the government, we talked about NOAA and all the things that they have done. Um, well, they work with a lot of different organizations. They don't do it by themselves. If they did, they wouldn't have enough people, they wouldn't have enough money, they wouldn't have enough resources. So we work with non-government organizations. Um, some of the ones I work with are IFA, New England Aquarium, the Whale and Dolphin Conservation, I did mention before. Um, and they do all sorts of things. This was at the 4th of July parade. We have public programming, things like Whale Sense or Sea Spout Watch Out are for people who either are recreational boater or for whale watching companies so that they can learn about some of the guidelines that they need to deal with in order to know how to identify a right whale and what the laws are, things like that. There's boater safety courses either through the Power Squadron or maybe the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary where you can learn some supplementary information about those animals. And of course, NOAA puts out all sorts of pamphlets, all sorts of charts, and also there's, there's books. I did mention The Urban Whale by Scott Krauss. Fascinating read, if you're a scientist. Um, so yeah, and also, <coughs> right whale celebrations. Can't forget those. Okay, so the traffic separation scheme that I was talking about before, the TSS, was that lane shift. We did it in Boston in 2006, I believe. It worked so well that very recently Santa Barbara, off the coast of California, did the very same thing along the coast here because this is a migratory corridor, a migratory corridor for a number of animals, particularly the gray whales, which sometimes in a day, if you're looking from a fantastic point from land, you can see 20 or 30 of them actually swim by you. So they're so thick and dense with animals there, they decided to shift their lane just less than one nautical mile. And since they've done that, there have been no incidences. So that's really fantastic. That just happened last year, but it's a pretty good thing to know that all you have to do is shift a little bit of your behavior and you make a really huge difference. There were a lot of whales washing up on the beach and now there aren't, so maybe that will help. Are we really crossing the right bridges and going down the right canals to save the right whales? Well, not, not quite. Um, we do still have some incidences. And so that's an issue. We talked about the ship strike rule. It's a really important facet of, of my life. I probably write at least 20 pages a week in commentary just on that one piece of law, and I am not a lawyer. <laughs> but 
there are some inconsistencies with it. You know, we have seasonal management areas, like I was talking about before, and they're not connected. We have critical habitat points in the northeast and in the southeast and in the mid-Atlantic, and they're not connected. Well, whales don't play hopscotch, you know, they need to have some protections in between. These seasons are not really long enough, because I've seen whales, personally seen whales, outside of the seasonal management areas in other times of the year, and inside the seasonal management areas at other times of the year where they're not listed. So there's some issues. And then there's that other concern about the vessels under 65 feet. Well, those affect the whales too, so we're going to address that right now. What can technology do to help? If you can't see it, hey, at Big Back Chip, slow it down already. Hashtag speed kills. <laughs> at Big Back Chip replies, okay, fine, be safe, little buddy. Hashtag save the whales. <laughs> Say it every day. So, the first thing to know, we have some rules in place. Maybe they're not good enough, but there are rules, okay? Don't eat your ice cream before dinner. Mm -hmm. Well, does that exclude M&Ms? <laughs> okay, are the rules being followed? I mentioned before that enforcement is, is performed by NOAA, okay? We can't go out there with our guns and pitchforks ablaze and telling people what to do. We can talk about it, but we can't enforce it, right? There are some really hefty fines. Now, this is gonna be a mishmash to you, and I'm sorry about that, but what I did want to display with this particular slide is just to show you that there is a compliance guide for right whales and the ship strike reduction rule, or the ship strike rule, as I mentioned before. These are maps to show what the routes are on the, the East Coast, because as I said, right whales don't exist anywhere else in the world. In fact, maybe I didn't mention, but the current number sits at 492 for the estimate. Okay? So if there's 492 potentially animals left in this world of this particular species, and they're only along one coast, it should be easy. We have almost every single one of them named. The reality is, they don't all have little GPS beepers on them, so we can't know where they are. So we, we make these management areas where people have to slow down, and here are the, the routes, and the, the um, latitude and longitude, and these are the dates which you're supposed to follow them. Does that look easy to you? <sighs> I'm getting a headache just talking about it. Okay. So we have, to, we have to figure out how we need to make this a little bit more people friendly, okay? So that's tough. We have some really great methods of technology. If anybody's a mariner in here or a boater or teaches anything in maritime industry or anything like that, I'm sure you've heard of the AIS tracker, the automatic identification system. Not all vessels have these, they're pretty expensive and they're generally only on larger boats. However, according to the ship strike rule, <coughs> only larger boats above 65 feet need to be following the rule anyway. So that's a start. That and the GPS systems can really help to transmit things over VHF radios and find out where boats are, who boats are, and whether they're following the rules. I just had a really interesting conversation with the director at the National Transportation System Center at Volpe, which is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And they are an independent organization full of smarty pants people from MIT and all over the world. And what they have done is developed this amazing tool, which we now can apply today. It's called the MISSES, or the Maritime Safety and Security Information System. And it was originally designed for people in the Mediterranean Sea to just know what kind of boats were in the area and what they were doing. And they started applying this technique of using, <coughs> leveraging Google Earth and using AIS trackers to know where boats were and seeing if there was any trafficking issue going on, some drug problems, maybe human trafficking or illegal fishing activity, things like that. It turns out that's a really great method to know what speeds different boats are going in certain areas. So goody, we took that and we put it right into our system here and now we're using it. And even better than that, I know this is a boring slide, but this is a really interesting topic to me, can you tell? <laughs> we share this with other governments. So maybe the right whale issue is sort of an American, maybe a little bit of Canadian problem, okay? It helps us talk to Canada. There are 72 countries who are applying this system as of right now from a little tiny center in Cambridge that's being used all over the world now. I mean, I'm talking places in Africa you have never heard of. It's so amazing. And so I definitely encourage you, if you are in the maritime field, to take a peek at that if you haven't done so already because this is actually changing how we enforce things and it's changing the, the field from knowing, seeing that there's a blank canvas to knowing everything that's on it. Right now, 62,000 vessels, as of today, are being monitored through the system. That's really great to know where the ships are, but where are those whales? Well, 
there's one right there. <laughs> Monitoring whales with shared databases is really important. There's lots of scientists out there, and there's lots of people who, who like myself, are really interested in them. And they might learn some information. For example, at 1403 on September 13, 2013, I saw a right whale uh, number, number I, mean, I don't even know what number, um, it, you know, in the afternoon. If I kept that to myself, what good would it have done? Not much, because I'm not sharing the information with anyone. So there's databases that exist so that everyone can know what's going on, and then they can share that, that data. <coughs> the way that we collect data for whales is two ways. There's the really fun one of boat surveys where you can go out and look with your eyes, because there's no special equipment to see a whale. Remember how hard I said that was, mm. okay? And then there's the other way, which is even more fun. <laughs> That's the aerial way. you got to get a plane out there. Now, you have to have a special permit to do this. But in this area, we have <coughs> two very special, very dedicated, very large organizations. The Provincetown Center for Coastal Studies, which is now just called the Center for Coastal Studies, and the New England Aquarium. <coughs> and they have specialized right whale research teams that go out and take a peek for these guys. And they do this on a very regular basis in season and also a little bit before and shifting into a little bit after the season so they can kind of cover both sides and make sure they get all those red herrings out there that may have come in a little late or left a little early. So we have this other really fantastic tool that has been expanded upon over the last 10 or so years and that is called the Right Whale Listening Network and that has stationary buoys that are set up along the TSS, that traffic separation scheme, along Boston Harbor and around Cape Cod Bay. And you know what they're doing? They're listening. They're listening for right whales. You ever heard a whale sing? Mm -hmm. Come to my talk in May and I'll tell you all about it. You can listen to the right whales. Between now and then you can YouTube it. But to listen to a right whale is so amazing. They don't do it all the time, but for different behavioral reasons, they love to emit sounds. And it's really amazing to listen to. The other thing is, you can detect them from five miles away. So if you put a little buoy in the water, they're a little expensive to start. I'm not even going to name a price because you might fall out of your chair. But we put these passive acoustic monitors out, okay? Passive because they're not reaching out and doing any kind of damage to the animal. They're just listening. They pick up the data. The data bounces all the way back to the lab at Cornell <laughs> University. A technician listens and says, hey, is that a right whale? Oh yeah, that's a right whale. Okay. And then they send a message all the way back to all the different field stations and to the vessels. And we find out, hey, that's a right whale and it's in this particular spot and you need to go around it or slow down. Okay. If you want to know more about that, check out listenforwhales.org. This is a baby right whale. <laughs> See how cute that is? Only about 20 feet long. How it dwarfs. Um, how do we inform the public? Again, we talked about passive acoustic monitoring and we talked about <coughs> Um, the databases and we talked about the Volpe Center and how to get all this information but how do we tell you about it? Well again technology, technology, technology. Moms and dads, grandma and grandpa get your butts on Facebook, it's time. Okay? There's lots of information on there. It's not just for saying hey what's up, what are you doing on Friday night? Okay? There's actually some really interesting stuff going on and all sorts of organizations are putting out information. So for risk management, or what you can learn about and do for the right whales, or any cause you care about, generally, you can go to public education nights, like this, mm -hmm. or you can go to social media, Facebook, Vimeo, Twitter, YouTube, Flickr, all these different places carry some really interesting information. You kind of have to sift through it at first until you realize, you know, what works and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. But for example, on Flickr, I go to the Georgia Department of Natural Resources, and there are amazing up-to-the-minute photos of right whales with the permit number attached to them, mm -hmm. some of which I used in this talk. Okay. Um, as far as warning management goes, and that's what you can do about whales right now, if you're in the water, you say, this is great, I know all this stuff about right whales, I can identify one in a book. How does that help me in the field? I'm on a fishing trip with my pals and maybe we stayed up too late last night and I don't know what to do, okay? We have the NOAA websites, we have the chart publications that tell us about the areas that you need to, to slow down in, okay? And we also have this other really cool feature called the Whale Alert app. Whale Alert is the bomb, okay? <laughs> Whale Alert provides you with a number of dynamic information. As I said before, the Volpe Center puts out all kinds of fabulous stuff for the larger vessels. Doesn't really do much for the smaller ones because they don't have AIS. But check your back pockets. Did everybody bring a phone with them tonight? Mm -hmm. Most of them are smartphones? Okay, cool. When you get home, your homework assignment, yeah, there's a homework assignment. 
okay, is to, to get this free, free, free application and check it out. Even if you never get your, yourself on the water, hey, it's really cool to look at the maps and see where the whales are, okay? It tells you current ship location if you're on the water and the speed you're going. It tells you the MSRS, the um, mandatory ship reporting system, and it tells you about you know, what the numbers you need to call if you see a right whale, okay? It tells you ATBA, or areas to be avoided, that's a voluntary area where if you're kind of getting a little close, you could maybe slow it down a bit, and that would be a really nice thing to do. It tells you recommended routes. If there's areas that are kind of whale dense, there's areas you can go around them. And it even gives you a photo gallery and an ID, so you can say, is that a right whale? I'm not really sure, because you don't want to be caught breaking the law. It does happen. So this is something that uses the AIS, as we talked about before, it uses GPS, and it, it gives so much information that it just helps us really protect animals right where you are in the water, and it has made a huge difference. Um, it's still in just its first years of birth, but it's getting to be more prevalent, and um, this is a picture right off my phone. It's very easy to get. The, the data is pretty instantaneous. Within two seconds, you can figure out where they are. Um, and just to give you a visual, all these right here, that's the right whale listening network and, and the animals that they're hearing. So the green means, okay, you can go. It's not, not an area where there's whales, but the yellow means start to slow down now. We had a couple of animals picked up on our passive acoustic monitoring today. So it's really easy. It's, it's just like stoplights. Red, yellow, green. Easy. You can't get easier than that. Here's what you came for tonight, right? Beach watching for right whales. Has anybody seen a whale from the beach before? Yay! Has anybody seen a right whale from the beach before? Okay, getting smaller. Has anybody ever gone out on a lunch date with a right whale? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, uh, we all live on the Cape or Plymouth area. Is there anyone who's further than Plymouth or Cape? <coughs> okay, I'm not that popular. Anyway, <laughs> it's just a few steps away, right? And right now, right now is the time. All of this is Plymouth and Cape area. Don't look on this side. You're not going to see them there. Don't bother. Don't waste your time. Don't even go down there. The ice cream is too expensive anyway. Okay? <laughs> Up here is P-Town. Okay? Barnstable area. In September, I saw a whale right here. Um, in December, there were whales right over here. All right? We're going to see a little map that shows that a little closer. Here are some whale watching tips before I give you the locations, okay? <coughs> These are super secret, not so secret, locations that you're not supposed to tell anyone, tell everyone, <laughs> all about where they are, okay? Before you do, here's a lovely image of our next month's speaker looking in the wrong direction for whales, okay? <laughs> Beach is over here. <laughs> just kidding, he was, he was totally looking at a snowy owl and I just thought I'd find a way to work it in there. Okay, so that's, that's the first one, and, and don't forget, I put in the right, or the right whale in the right direction, okay? That's tip number one. Tip number two, go with the appropriate times of year, okay? Feeding areas, remember how I talked about those SMAs or seasonal management areas? They're all over NOAA, they're all over charts, they're all over Lindsay's Facebook, okay? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so if you can't see the dates, that's okay. I kind of put the, the general ideas up here. Here we are in Cape Cod Bay, January to middle of May, okay? And just outside the backside of the Cape and above it, in Massachusetts Bay Area, March to April. And then way out here in the Great South Channel, I mean, if you really get bold and you want to go sword fishing or something, feel free, but April through July, okay? So go at the appropriate time of year to the beaches and you might be able to see something. And if you don't know how to use a calendar, you might see them anyway, because as I said, <laughs> September 13, 2013, look at the whale. Let me bring you back, can we go back one? Sure. September 13, okay, was right about up here. So that area is off Race Point, <coughs> Provincetown, the time of year for that, that you should be seeing them per the seasonal management area, maybe science hasn't caught up with us yet, March to the end of April. It was September when a whale popped up right next to my boat and we had to put it in, a, you know, in neutral. So you never know what you're going to see. Here was me leaving Plymouth Harbor. There's Bug Light. You guys know Bug Light? Mm -hmm. Of course you know Bug Light. And then just off Race Point. Mm -hmm. Just off Ray's Point. You never know how, how soon or when you're going to see them, and you also never know where. Look at the beach. That's a person. Mm. That's Do you want to see some whales? Wow. Go see some whales. <laughs> beach watching for right whales. All along Plymouth, especially South Plymouth. Does anyone here live in Ellisville Harbor area? 
No, but I go there almost every day. Mm -hmm. Super. Mm -hmm. Great place to bird watch. I mean, I'm not just plugging whales here. Bird watch. Mm -hmm. If you want more information about that, go to Goldenrod Foundation on Facebook. On Facebook. It's great. Mm -hmm. Very easy to get to. Tons of parking. Oh, there's mm -hmm. a state park right there. You can just walk around and it's not a problem. It's really super ultra safe there. It's great. So that's a spot you can go. <coughs> Remember, this is right in Plymouth. Um, my personal favorite, just because the vantage point is incredible, mm -hmm. note the snow in the ground. I took this picture recently, okay? Man, I'm at point, just off Taylor Avenue. So this is kind of another vantage point. I'm looking to the right here if I'm looking out at the ocean. You can see there's a few homes and, and you know, there's some points of rock at low tide. On the other side, that's Manomet, that's White Horse Beach. You know, White Horse Beach is a great place to swim, but also within a half of a mile from shore, we have seen right whales before, like last year. Yeah, so check that out. Um, <coughs> also to plug seals, if you like to seal watch and you like to see them perched on rocks like little bananas, a great time to go is February to just see them at low tide as well. So if you're interested in that. Beach watching for right whales on Sandy Neck in Barnstable. All summer long when I go whale watching on the highest whale watcher out of Barnstable Harbor, I go right by Sandy Neck and I see a million boats who have no idea that a few months before there were right whales eating there. In fact, just one mile offshore last week, it was all over the New England Aquarium website that they had seen a couple of whales out there. I tried to go myself, but I was working. Such a shame. We got good pictures though. It's a beautiful lighthouse. And um, just to mention, sort of a, a sadness, a, a, look, a look back to the 1700s and 1800s. At one time, that lighthouse was fueled 100% entirely by whale oil. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, you can't see it in this picture. I think it's just right here. I should have expanded it a tad more. There's a little teeny tiny red house called the oil house um, that, that stored all that oil mm -hmm. for that lighthouse long ago. And there's other spots too. This is just a general idea. And if anybody would like to have the PDF for this, just so that you can know where they are, or you want to get email, I can give that to you so you know. Um, Cape Cod Avenue, Manhattan Beach Road, Hyannis Road, George Street in Cedarville. Do you, you see the trend is, you know, from Plymouth Beach south, okay? Great feeding there for that Calanus finmarchicus, the little copepod-like plankton that the, um, the right whale eat. So I have a few photos of that. And also on, on uh, the Cape, well, essentially anywhere in Provincetown is fine because it's pretty much completely surrounded by water. In fact, I think there's this one really tall structure up there, made of stone, Pilgrim Monument. Have you ever been up there? I've seen whales up there too. Um, I spent some time at the Marconi site all through last March looking for whales. I did not find any the two days that I was there. The very next day when I went home, saw it online, there were whales there when I wasn't looking, of course. But those are some great spots. Now, I know what you're all looking for. What can you do tonight? What did I tell you to go home and do? Does anyone remember? Download the, app. Download the app. There's one other thing. You're getting online, so you might as well go to Facebook. Okay? Get on social media. Take a look. Places like the New England Aquarium and the Center for Coastal Studies. I hate to just keep plugging and plugging, but if you want to learn about whales, not just the right whale, but anyone, go to those. They have amazing programs, amazing research going on, and you know it's really tough to fund those. All of the budgets for the grants keep shrinking and shrinking. Mm -hmm. Any time or any monetary Christmas gift that you want to that you want to donate is a really nice thing to do. Getting the work a word out, tell the world about whales any way you can, whether it be through conversations, through spreading the pictures, through um, whale watching from the beach, whatever you want to do that works. You know, coloring books for three-year-olds has worked really well for me to start a conversation with little kids about this, and they've grown up really loving whales. And then you know you can always volunteer with or support in some way some of the places that do all this good work. The local ones that I have alluded to excessively. Um, our New England Aquarium, IFA, the Whale and Dolphin Conservation, and of course I can't forget that lovely branch of the government from, the, uh, from uh, NOAA. We do have a Northeast, uh, Northeast Regional Office, <coughs> and that office is in Gloucester. There are more local people that do all sorts of work around here and support the conservation efforts, so um, if you get a chance, grab the wheel <laughs> and get out there, okay? And uh, that's about it. So. If you would like to stick around for a few minutes, feel free to do that. I do have some other specimens, including the very stinky dolphin skull, if you would like to smell it. Um, and as far as future talks for us, when Juan Basakalubi, the law student from Lewis and Clark, is coming, and he's going to talk all about coastal conservation in his area, the coastal management. 
a zone management. You can find that on Goldenrod Foundation on Twitter or on Facebook, the Goldenrod Foundation. And if you want to hear more about whales, because that's essentially all that I talk about, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you can find me on Twitter. I'm also on Facebook, but some of the stuff on Facebook tends to be more about turtles and not just about whales. So if you hate turtles, don't go there. <laughs> I hate turtles right now. <laughs> so if, does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask about? And I'll, and I'll pull out this again. And I know we have tight quarters in here, but anybody's welcome to skip around the room, eat some more food, look at some things if you like. Does anyone have questions about the right whale that they would like to ask? And with all this technology, these laws are good probably in Canada and the United States. Are they internationally um, upheld? They are not, So actually. someone can use that great technology and abuse it, right? Mm -hmm. They absolutely can, mm -hmm. and that is why the Volpe Center Wow, that looks scary. I'm sorry about that. Um, that is why, okay, so I'm sorry. The question that she asked was, can, can these pieces of technology, like the passive acoustic monitoring or um, this really fantastic program, the maritime safety and security feature from the Volpe, can they be used internationally? Are they upheld as international, um, as part of law? Well, they're not in the law. As far as things like the ship strike rule, well, that's a federal law for the United States. However, Applying that technique, as we did with the traffic separation scheme from Boston to Santa Barbara, California, is a really great model for success. And so other countries are starting to pick up on that flavor and say, hey, they found some success. Maybe we can use this for other animals. And, and they are starting to do that. Um, part of my work is to start thinking about methods of vessel strike mitigation for other animals like the blue whales in Sri Lanka. Um, and, and the hope is that they will be able to pick up some forms of the technology thinking about things like um, what the Volpe Center is doing, and they're extending, or maybe I'll say encroaching upon many countries to talk about things like that. And Our hope is that through public education, through the public's voice, we'll be able to get others to speak about this issue and to start potentially applying it. There's always an initial startup cost, but when people get to liking something, it sure becomes a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a really good start. I'm sorry I can't answer that very particularly for one topic, but yes, mm -hmm. it can apply. It can. Other questions about right whales? Yes. They have some really interesting technology that they're using to track bird migrations across thousands of miles. And I know that's not going to work very well underwater, but when the whale surfaces, is there any any effort going on to tag whales so that they can be tracked Satellite. and located? Yes. yes. So the question was, is there any effort, as with flights for bird migrations, to be able to track whales? There actually is. It is horrendously expensive. So we have to sort of pick and choose the animals we do. But good thing, there's only 492 right whales left, and we know essentially who all of them are, because we can track them individually. And the way that we do that... Oh, you're so super awkward yet beautiful. Um, <laughs> the way that we do that, and I'm sorry this is so small, but again, anyone is welcome to come up after, is through these little white bumps here on top of the right wheel. These are called callosities. Has anyone ever heard of these or seen them before? Yeah. Okay. Um, if you want to bop back a couple slides. Sure. Yeah, so that the bailing plates, if you can see, while I'm here, I'll just explain them very quickly. These are set up almost like window shades or Venetian blinds, and they all face with the, the fuzzy part. The fuzzy part is on the inside where it's going to filter, and the more external part, and this actually it goes the other way, but it's so cumbersome, um, the, the more smooth part of the plate is, is on the outside. And so what happens is the animal um, takes in water and filters out all those little pieces and then blows out all the water again. So they inflate their huge, huge throat like a pelican, and then they take in what they need, they push out all the water, and all of the, that callinus, the copepods, stick to the inside and they scrape it off with their giant tongue and swallow mm. it with their teeny tiny itty bitty throat. Mm. So, but that's not what identifies them. What identifies them is up here, these, these, I guess I'll call them markings, but they're really a growth of some sort. What they are is um, a dermal condition on the whale called a callosity that, that fills over, over their lifetime with um, teeny little organisms mm. that are similar to an arachnid, actually. They're basically a tiny little parasite that, that doesn't bother the animal at all, but they're pretty white looking. And so, even from the sky, from the water, you can imagine, you see that bright white first. Mm. And so it's a really great way to mark each individual because, go figure, just like human faces, 
every single pattern on every single whale is different. Mm -hmm. Somebody must have been staring at whales a really long time to figure that out, but <laughs> <laughs> there are ways to do it. <laughs> With the humpback whale, some of you may have gone on, on uh, visits to the Captain John or another boat where you've seen humpback whales, and when they dive, their, their tail comes up in the air. And they have a very specific pattern, like a thumbprint, on their on the back of their fluke, the ventral portion of their fluke. And so those, to me, are a little bit more recognizable. The right whales, it's kind of like ink blots to me. But in any <laughs> case, we can track individuals. And when we do that, we, fought, we have actually a tag, a, a very special, very expensive tag, that has been developed by um, a man, a very smart man in, um, in this field. His name's Dave Wiley. He invented a D-tag. And it's actually, it's so non-invasive to the animal that you can actually go up to the animal in a boat, if you have a special permit, and suction cup it right on their bum, or on their, <laughs> their shoulder blade, or wherever you need to. And that has a sensor on it, a GPS sensor. And so when the animal dives down into the water after that, this very non-invasive technique, they are able to track the movements of the animal, and how they feed, and how much time they spend in the, on the bottom, and after a little while, unfortunately, maybe 24 or 48 hours, that little D-tag pops off, mm -hmm. and we can retrieve it because it floats. Thank God mm -hmm. <laughs> it floats because they're pretty expensive. And then we can take all the data off of that. Um, and there are some now, just in the last year or so, I don't know a lot about them because I'm not on those projects, but um, they, they'll be able to, via satellite, just get that information right away, and they'll even have to worry about collecting the tag. But the tags can be used again. Um, that is the most modern way to be able to track those animals. We do have a program out of the Center for Coastal Studies that we also do with the humpback whales. There are more humpback whales, but they're also endangered. Um, and that one is, is through a bit of a core. See, they have a lot of blubber. So we can stick a little core, and then it's kind of like if you have a splinter, and it stays in for a while, and we can identify them through that as well. Um, there are also cow tags. Anyone ever seen like an earring on a cow before? We do that sometimes with, with dolphin fins, the fins on their back. Uh, so there are ways to identify them, and that work is being done all the time. We do like to, to see that identification and know where the whales go, and that's really helping us with the surveys, but they're kind of few and far between. But we're working on it, or I'll say they're working on it. Not my project, but maybe I'll learn more by May and be able to tell you more. So, great. So does anyone else have any other questions before they either take off or attack the snack table? <laughs> No? Okay. Thank well, you so much. Thank you. Thank you.